Hi class, welcome to Unit 8 for MedSurg 2, and this is where we're talking about um, caring for patients with problems of either the central nervous system or and the peripheral nervous system. So let's start off by talking about migraines, very common diagnosis. Uh, migraines are chronic episodic disorder that is characterized by intense pain, usually on one side of the head, and it worsens with movement and it occurs either with photophobia or phonophobia. Uh, phonophobia is sensitivity to sound. Uh, nausea and vomiting are also commonly associated with this, and a migraine can last anywhere from 4 to 72 hours. Um, this uh, is in contrast with a cluster headache. That is an intense unilateral pain that yet generally occurs in the spring and fall without a warning, and the pain typically lasts less than four hours. Um, migraine headaches uh, typically occur with ipsilateral, meaning same side, tearing of the eyes, runny nose. Um, you can have uh, eyelid edema, meiosis, that is constriction of the pupil. Um, what do we do for migraines? Well, migraines basically fall into three categories. Migraines with aura, migraines without aura, and an atypical migraine. What is an aura? It's a sensation such as visual changes that signals the onset of a headache, or people can have auras if they have epilepsy or a seizure disorder. Um, in your textbook, there is a table I believe it's 44-1 that has the key features of migraines. I would review that. Um, auras can also be smells or visual disturbances. And what do we do for a migraine? There are the three R's. We want to recognize what it is. We want to respond and get help, see the physician. And then we want to relieve that pain and the associated symptoms. So there's uh, three main types of therapy. The first is abortive therapy, and that is when we relieve symptoms during either the aura phase or very shortly after the migraine pain has started. There are many pain interventions, which frequently include drugs such as NSAIDs. Um, a common one is Toradol. We can also use medications for uh, antiemetics, such as Reglan or Zofran, to treat nausea. Um, we do want to be careful with abortive therapy, for example, Imitrex and other medications in that same drug class. If patients have cardiovascular disease, Prinz metal angina or chest pain, or a history of hypertension. The reason why is because these um, abortive medications like Imitrex produce a vasoconstrictive effect, and that could exacerbate any cardiovascular disease. Patients can also take a beta blocker for acute migraine symptoms and as well for preventative migraine symptoms. Um, and uh, it's more commonly for preventative though. Um, so preventative therapy is when we take a medication on a daily basis to minimize the chance of migraines occurring. And the common drug classes for preventative therapy are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or some anti-epileptic medications, for example, Topamax. Um, and usually these are used at lower doses than if we were treating um, a cardiovascular or epileptic condition. Uh, one thing that we have found with beta blockers and why they're a common choice for preventative migraine medication is that beta blockers also work to prevent the vascular changes that can occur related to migraines. And then lastly, uh, complementary and alternative therapies, doing things like yoga, meditation, massage, exercising, including in our treatment plan for someone that is having a migraine, things like laying down in a dark, quiet room will also um, decrease the um, nausea, photophobia, phenophobia that occurs with migraines. Um, so cluster headaches are technically different, but they're often treated with the same medications. 
Um, some additional things that we can do for both migraines and cluster headaches is uh, wearing sunglasses to avoid light sensitivity. Um, we can also give them uh, supplemental oxygen. Um, if uh, patients that have chronic drug re resistant uh, cluster headaches can also have some surgical options, um, but again, that is not a first line option for treatment. So uh, seizures versus epilepsy. Um, there are different types of seizures. Um, people can have seizures for many different reasons. Um, seizures are basically um, a result of abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Um, things like an electrolyte imbalance, infection, high fevers, all those can trigger a seizure, or people can be diagnosed with epilepsy. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder marked by sudden recurrent episodes of um, seizure activity, and it usually is accompanied by sensory disturbances, loss of consciousness, and Seizures themselves have different classifications. You can have a generalized seizure, and those are typically tonic-clonic or absent seizures. Tonic-clonic used to be called grand mal, and may sometimes be still referred to a grand mal. And then absent seizures are old time called petite mal. Um, tonic-clonic seizures are characterized by generalized alternating muscle spasms and jerkiness. The tonic phase is the stiffening, and the clonic phase is the rhythmic jerking. That's kind of how you can keep those straight. Um, absent seizures are a brief loss of consciousness, and it looks like they're just blankly staring out into nothing like they're daydreaming. Absent seizures are a little bit more common in children and do tend to run in families. The next classification after generalized is partial seizures. Um, partial seizures are known as focal or localized seizures. These begin in one part of the cerebral hemisphere versus generalized involves both hemispheres of the brain. Partial seizures are further divided into two groups. You can have a complex partial seizure where you lose consciousness, or you can have a simple partial seizure and the patient will remain conscious. You can have an unclassified seizure. Those are ones that happen for no apparent reason and don't fit nicely into another category. And again, you can have a secondary seizure. That can be caused by something else, like a brain tumor or a brain lesion that is triggering the seizures. And if we treat the brain tumor or a lesion, we treat the seizures. So just to break it down again for you, to help keep it straight in, my mi in your mind, <laughs> uh, tonic-clonic begins with stiffening or rigidity of the muscles in the limbs. That's the tonic, loss of consciousness, then the rhythmic jerking or the clonic stage. So tonic begins with stiffening or rigidity of the muscles, loss of consciousness, clonic, rhythmic muscle jerking due to muscle contraction and relaxation, absent seizures, brief loss of consciousness, awareness, staring into space, they appear to be daydreaming. Myoclonic is brief stiffening or jerking of an extremity, either singularly or in groups. Atonic means there's loss of muscle tone. Partials can be broken down into simple. Those many times begin with an aura. You may have unilateral unusual sensations or movement of an extremity. You can have an autonomic reaction, for example, increase in heart rate or flushing. You can have psychic changes, and typically there's no loss of consciousness. Versus complex, you're going to have loss of consciousness, and usually autosomatoms, like lip smacking, picking, and patting are common with this um, type of seizure. And remember, uh, generalized seizures involve both hemispheres of the brain. Partials involve one hemisphere of the brain. 
So no matter what type of seizure, there are some common uh, risk factors. So like I said, there are many different reasons why a patient could have a street, uh, seizure. They could have a metabolic disorder. They could be going through acute alcohol withdrawal. They could have acid-base imbalances, electrolyte imbalances, uh, a high fever, infection. They could experience a stroke or um, being um, abusing substances can trigger a seizure. Um, or detoxing from substances can trigger a seizure. Uh, so then there's this group of, okay, what do we as nurses need to do to um, be prepared if a seizure was to occur? That's kind of how you should think of seizure precautions. So we want to have oxygen and suction equipment set up in the room ready to go so that if a patient does have a seizure, all we have to do is reach for it and it's ready to, to apply to the patient. Um, another high priority is maintaining that airway. So patient positioning will usually have them flat in bed and then laying on a side and then keeping that head up to maintain that airway. We keep them on their side to prevent aspiration risk. We're going to maintain good IV access because if that seizure does not stop in less than five minutes or if they have a series of seizures within 30 minutes, we're going to give them some IV medications to abort those seizures. Um, uh, side rails should be up. They should be padded, and that is to protect and prevent injury. We're going to maintain these patients on bed rest. Any patient that it is reasonable to think that they might be experiencing a seizure, we put them on bed rest because we don't want them to be up walking when the seizure occurs. And then lastly, uh, no tongue blades. We no longer put anything into a patient's mouth while they are having a seizure. Um, on the side rails, a side note is if seizure pads are not available, you want to use blankets to pad those side rails. Um, and then if a patient is seizing, what are we watching for? When do we know they need oxygen? When they start showing signs of deoxygenation. Um, so if they show any signs of cyanosis, so uh, we don't want to wait till they're turning blue if they look real pale, if their respirations don't seem to be adequate for good oxygenation, if we have an oxygen satu uh, saturation, um, O2 sat on them, is it trending downwards? We're gonna go ahead and put oxygen on them. Okay, so if a patient has seizures, they are going through a seizure, what are we going to do? We're going to observe, document, maintain patient safety, get them in that sideline position, and do not use any restraints. So we're going to monitor the patient during the seizure for their breathing, their skin color. We're going to monitor for the duration of the seizure and what type of seizure activity do we see so that we can provide that information to the physician, especially if we don't know what type of seizure disorder a patient has. We're also going to monitor and assess these patients for bowel or bladder incontinence and get them cleaned up quickly afterwards. What do we do medication-wise? Um, if someone is having uh, a series of seizures, we need to stop it quickly. If we want to prevent a seizure from turning into status epileptic, um, which is going to be discussed further on the next slide, um, we want to be expecting, anticipating, and administering either IV lorazepam or IV diazepam. Those are our first line drugs for uh, a seizure uh, to abort it. Uh, then after we give those, we'll be thinking, okay, are we gonna give a loading dose of phenytoin or another type of anti-epileptic medication? Um, but we're always gonna give the Ataman or Valium first. So if they have status epileptus, that's a prolonged seizure that lasts for more than five minutes or a series of repeated seizures over the curse, uh, excuse me, the course of 30 minutes. This is a medical emergency. Um, some common causes of status epileptus is sudden withdrawal from anti-epileptic medications, 
infections, alcohol withdrawal, head trauma, cerebral edema or and metabolic disturbances. So what are we going to do? We're going to establish an airway, maintain airway, prevent aspirations. We're going to get an arterial blood gas if we have any concerns about acid base imbalance or oxygenation. We're going to expect to give IV lorazepam or diazepam. IV push. We could even do a rectal diazepam dose, and we could do a loading dose of IV phenytoin after those medications. Um, so drug therapy, uh, most epileptics are going to be, well, all epileptics are, are going to be on some sort of preventative medication, anti-epileptic medication. So whatever their drug is, what is the most recent blood value? What is the therapeutic level? Most of these drugs have a narrow therapeutic index, so a, a safe drug range. For example, Dilantin. Phenytoin is a commonly prescribed anti-epileptic medication, um, and it has a set range of 10 to 20. Um, anything above that, you can see some signs and symptoms of adverse effects, overdose, we want to be mindful of, okay, what are the drug-drug, drug-food interactions with a given anti-epileptic medication? Um, some things to keep in mind is those medications that are highly protein binding, for example, Coumadin or Warfarin, we don't want to give them at the same time as Phenytoin. And we want to monitor for any adverse or side effects and treat those conditions properly. We want to educate patient and their support people or uh, family members. Um, so you want to be telling them to take the prescribed seizure medication as prescribed every day, even if their seizures stop. We also want to coordinate with social services if medication cost is an issue. Um, they can also be a good resource for employment information, for information about when can a patient drive, that sort of thing. Um, we want to educate patients to what could be some potential side effects and raise awareness that they need to report those to us and that they should continue taking the medication even if they have side effects. Uh, we can do some surgical management for seizures. Um, and some of these are listed in your textbook and are described in your textbook. That's usually, um, usually for nurses, we want to just be aware that there are surgical managements. Um, they're usually not turned to unless a patient fails medication management. Uh, then we switch gears to talk about meningitis. There are two types of meningitis. There's viral and bacterial. Viral is usually uh, brief, and most people have a complete recovery. Bacterial meningitis is more severe. Uh, it is frequently life-threatening and usually has a fast onset of within 24 hours. The symptoms of both are the same. Um, and you're going to have fever and... Um, the other key symptom is neutral rigidity, and uh, that is usually what triggers the pain upon flexion of the neck. Those are kind of the key symptoms that we um, look for. So what can cause meningitis? Viral is pretty self-explanatory. It's triggered by like... Um, the herpes simplex virus. Um, bacterial is the one that is um, meningococcal related and that's typically what you hear about in outbreaks in like college dorms and that sort of thing. It's more common in the colder months and when you have large groups of people in close contact. Um, for both of them you're going to adhere closely to standard precautions. Um, but with bacterial, you want to add droplet precautions as well. So that means wear a mask um, and uh, people in close contact with bacterial meningitis patients need to be prophylactically treated to prevent the full-blown 
disease process from occurring. So a little bit more about the physical manifestations. So uh, the key symptoms are that neutral uh, rigidity or neck pain um, and fever. Uh, there are some uh, key assessments that we can do and the two that should be in your mind are Koenig and Brzezinski's and we're going to talk about those on the next slide. Um, but basically all the symptoms revolve around meningeal irritation and spinal nerve irritation. So these are all neurological symptoms, headache, photophobia, indications of increased intracranial pressure, decreased mental status, focal neurological deficits, and then you can also have GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting. Um, the headache, nausea, vomiting, seizures, those usually go hand in hand with increased intracranial pressure. The photophobia is usually linked to irritation of cranial nerves. Fever, malaise, fatigue, muscle aches, myalgia is usually related to signs and symptoms of infection. Then we've got Koenig's and Brzezinski. The top picture is Koenig's. So to elicit Koenig signs, your patient is supine. The hip and knee are flexed at a right angle and then the knee is slowly extended. The appearance of resistance or pain during extension is a positive Koenig's. Um, for Brzezinski's, the uh, examiner keeps one hand behind the patient's head, the other hand on the chest to prevent the patient from rising. And then uh, uh, the head is lifted, reflex flexion of the patient hips and knees after the passive flexion of the necks constitutes a positive Prusinski sign. Okay, from there we move to diagnostics. What laboratory assessment should you expect for a patient that has a uh, risk for being diagnosed with meningitis? We're going to do a lumbar puncture. We're going to analyze the cerebral spinal fluid to look for uh, elevated white blood cells, protein, glucose. We can also do a CT scan. We can draw blood cultures which again, we're looking for signs and symptoms of infection. Um, you can do uh, a counter immunoelectrophoresis. That looks at antigens. Um, it could be used for rapid diagnosis of some bacterial and viral infections. We can look for a polar, polymerase chain reaction, which looks for DNA of an infection. Complete blood count, again, we're looking for infection. And then another one is x-rays. So let's talk a little bit more about that cerebral spinal fluid. And that's when we get a little bit of that spinal fluid and it can tell us, okay, are we looking at viral? Are we looking at bacterial um, type meningitis? If it's bacterial, it's gonna be cloudy. If it's viral, it could be clear but you're gonna have some abnormal white blood cells, protein, and glucose levels. Um, that's kind of the, the big take homes. Um, bacterial, you're gonna have the cloudy, and you're gonna have the abnormal white blood cell, protein, and glucose levels. And throw in elevated pressure as well. So how are we gonna treat meningitis? We're going to use broad spectrum antibiotics if it's bacterial. We're going to use hypertonic or hyperosmolar agents if patients have uh, signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. We're going to use anticonvulsants, again, to decrease the risk of seizure and increase intracranial pressure. We could use osmotic diuretics for cerebral edema. We can use glucocorticoid steroids to decrease inflammation in the brain. And again, with bacterial meningitis, we're going to do prophylactic treatment for those that have been in close contact with the meningitis um, bacterial type infected patient. Some nursing interventions, we're going to have these patients be on strict intake and output. We're going to decrease the uh, 
lighting of the room, so keep the room nice and dark to decrease the stimuli. We're going to do frequent neurological status assessments every two to four hours. These patients are going to be on seizure precautions. So oxygen, suction, set up, ready to go in the room. Um, uh, the side rails padded, these people are going to be on bed rest, that sort of thing. We're going to do standard precautions plus droplet precautions if they have bacterial meningitis, and we're going to expect to administer the meningitis vaccinations. From there, we talk to encephalitis. So encephalitis is inflammation of the brain tissue and the surrounding meninges. It can affect the cerebrum, brain stem, and cerebellum. Most commonly, this is caused by a virus. For example, it could be caused by mosquito bites and the West Nile, uh, tick bites. Um, it could be herpes simplex. Um, basically, what happens is a virus enters the central nervous system through the bloodstream, and then inflammation follows, and that damages the neurons. The big difference between meningitis and encephalitis is that encephalitis does not have pus. It doesn't have an exudate formation. With encephalitis, the goal is early identification of the virus and early recognition of the signs and symptoms. Doing those two things will improve the outcome, but know that the patient may have permanent brain damage. Signs and symptoms. Fever, because it's an infection. Um, headache, nausea, vomiting. Change in level of consciousness, including things like drowsiness, lethargy, progressing to stupor. You can have altered mental status, things like confusion, personality changes, disorientation, especially if they have increased intracranial pressure. Uh, you can have photophobia. You can have a stiff neck. You can have seizures, rash, abnormal reflexes. That is all due to brain tissue irritation. What tests are we going to do? We're going to do a lumbar puncture. We could do an EEG to look at brain function. We could do a PCR for antibodies. We could look at an MRI or a CT, and we're going to do blood cultures. And also the CBC, because again, we're looking for infection. How do we treat this? Okay, we are going to do good assessments, neurological and respiratory. We're going to watch for bradycardia. We're going to um, watch our vital signs for trends in increased intracranial pressure. We're going to administer antiviral medication or antibiotics, depending on whether it's viral or bacterial. We could give steroids, antipyretics, anticonvulsants, and diuretics like mannitol to manage the inflammation and increased intracranial pressure or cerebral edema. Nursing interventions, we're going to provide active or passive range of motion. So reposition these people every two hours. Do quality neurological assessments. We may need to do the Glasgow Coma Scale and provide a quiet, darkened environment and do strict intake and output. Uh, this is just a picture of hemorrhagic encephalitis, which can be sometimes seen in uh, herpes simplex encephalitis. So not a good thing to have. So switching gears, let's talk about Parkinson's disease now. Uh, Parkinson's, uh, approximately a million people have been diagnosed with Parkinson's and there's 50,000 new cases each year. It is uh, caused by an imbalance of dopamine and acetylcholine, which are neurotransmitters in the brain. The cause is not known. And in a normal brain, dopamine controls acetylcholine. But in Parkinson, there's an unexplained degeneration of dopamine, and that causes an imbalance between dopamine and acetylcholine. A large amount of acetylcholine stimulates neurons that release GABA, which causes the symptoms of Parkinson's. Therefore, dopamine stops working properly, causing too much acetylcholine, 
which is what makes muscles rigid. The classic signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease, um, a mask-like facial expression, slow shuffling gait, pill rolling of the hands, stooping posture, they have a tremor at rest, we can see changes in their handwriting, generally it gets smaller. They're going to have slower movement, which is called brazy, bradykinesia. They're going to have dysphagia or trouble chewing. They may experience drooling. Um, they can have dyskinesia, so that's difficulty controlling voluntary or fine motor movement. They can have rigidity of the limbs, and frequently they have problems with orthostatic hypotension. These are the kind of key signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. The next slide shows you that mask-like facial expression. So even though they don't show a lot of expression, they still have all of the normal emotions. So some nursing invention, interventions with Parkinson's would be um, to have them take bite-sized pieces and chew very well before swallowing. We're going to um, elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees and keep them upright after eating to uh, prevent uh, aspiration. We're going to watch for signs of aspiration. And remember, those are things like throat clearing, coughing, a gurgling noise, assessing the lungs, etc. Treatment, we're going to give them anti-Parkinson medications. Ideally, they should take these on an empty stomach, but know that these meds are notorious for causing GI upset, and if that happens, uh, have them take it with food. Just know that it's going to affect the absorption. Um, all right, I think those are the high points with Parkinson's. Let's move on to Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is an incurable dementia. It's chronic and progressive neurodegeneration. Um, onsets usually between 45, 65, and is accompanied by cognitive dysfunction. What happens is the neurofibrillary uh, junctions become tangled and plaque forms. And if you look in your textbook, it'll discuss the different stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, there are some uh, things that we need to do uh, to assess these patients and their symptoms. So do they have any difficulty with wandering? How do they react to change? Um, are they getting quality sleep at night? Are they taking medications as prescribed? Um, are they in a safe environment? Um, we want to assess their reaction to change so that uh, we know how they act out and we can manage those symptoms, for example, if they're admitted to the hospital. Um, we want to make sure that we do things like providing them with uninterrupted sleep at night. That will help um, minimize and manage alterations in behavior. Um, we want to stay on a normal routine. That helps as well. If they are wanderers, we want to provide them with frequent um, walks throughout the day. If they live at home, we want to make sure safety needs are being met so that the doors have bolts so that they can't wander outside. Um, and we want to make sure their environment is free of clutter so that they can't uh, trip. Um, a good physical assessment, uh, communication of what they're feeling may be impaired. So watching for uh, signs and symptoms of like urinary tract infection, uh, thirst. Those are things that we want to do with uh, Alzheimer's patients. Um, and then just to review, this slide just talks about um, the changes that happen um, in the neurons with Alzheimer's. This slide is just a reminder of those five A's. What is common with uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's? If your patient shows changes like decreased ability to concentrate, pay attention, make good judgment, if they are um, 
word finding, if they are having difficulty with their memory or identifying objects, that sort of thing. Those are all signs and symptoms that they need to be evaluated for Alzheimer's disease. Early identification is important because most of the Alzheimer medications are indicated for early um, stages of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. For example, uh, uh, Aricep is one commonly prescribed uh, uh, seizure or excuse me Alzheimer medication. Okay, so let's contrast that with Huntington disease. Huntington's disease is an inherited condition that causes uh, progressive uh, degeneration of nerve cells in the brain. Huntington disease has broad impact on a person's functional abilities, usually results in some jerky movement, uh, think uh, cholera, um, and then thinking or cognition and psychiatric disorders. Most people with Huntington disease develop it in their 30s and 40s, but the onset may be earlier or later. When the disease onset is before 20, the condition is uh, called juvenile Huntington disease, and the earlier onset usually um, has a somewhat different presentation and a faster disease progression. Um, it usually causes movement, cognitive, and psychiatric disorders that are on a wide spectrum of signs and symptoms. Um, when uh, during the, the course of the disease, some disorders are going to be more dominant or have a greater effect on their functional ability. How do we treat it? Um, early identification of the signs and symptoms. So personality changes, irritability, moodiness, psychological disturbances, uh, progressive dementia, restlessness or fidgeting related to the dyskinesia, abnormal jerking movements, chorea, uh, depression. We're going to do some tests. We're going to do some genetic tests. We're going to look at a CT or an MRI, and what that might show us is cerebral atrophy. We could do a PET scan, which could show us a decrease in glucose uptake in the brain. Treatment. Unfortunately, there's no cure. It is a progressive disease. What we try to do is treat the dyskinesia and behavior. Um, we can use meds like uh, phenothiazine or Haldol. Uh, nursing interventions protect against um, suicide, help with activities of daily living, provide safety and comfort. Those are the big nursing interventions. Uh, from there, we move on to Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is a disorder in which the body's immune system attacks part of the peripheral nervous system's myelin sheath. The first symptoms of this disorder include varying degrees of weakness or tingling sensations in the legs. In many instances, the symmetrical weakness and abnormal sensations called paresthesia spread to the arms and body. So Guillain-Barre is usually ascending symmetrical muscle weakness and paresthesia. So these symptoms can increase in intensity until certain muscles can't be used at all or when quite severe, the person becomes almost totally paralyzed. In those cases, this disorder is life-threatening because it potentially interferes with breathing and blood pressure and heart rate. If this happens, the patient is going to need to be electively intubated, intubated before it becomes an emergency. And if it starts to affect blood pressure or heart rate, it is a medical emergency. We will put these patients on a ventilator to help with breathing, and we're going to watch them very, very closely for complications like heart rate issues, infection, blood clots, blood pressure issues. That being said, most people have a good recovery from even the most severe cases of Guillain-Barre, although some will continue to have a certain degree of weakness. And an important thing to know is that Guillain-Barre 
typically occurs a few days or weeks after the patient has had symptoms of a viral infection, whether that be respiratory or GI. Very occasionally, uh, surgery or vaccinations can trigger the syndrome. This is the uh, picture of Guillain-Barre syndrome in a nutshell. Symmetrical ascending paralysis paresthesia. So what are the key signs and symptoms? Paresthesia, burning, numbness, tickling feeling due to that demyelination. They're going to have symmetrical weakness. They may have flaccid paralysis, usually ascending. As it goes up the body, they may have uh, respiratory issues. If so, they need uh, to be intubated and put on a vent. It could progress to facial weakness, dysphagia, visual changes. Facial weakness, dysphagia, and visual changes are not as common and usually associated with descending, but most commonly it's ascending. Um, if they do have eye involvement, it can cause blindness. What do we need to do? We need to monitor the progression of change in sensation. We need to monitor respiratory status for changes in effort, accessory muscle use, breath sounds, breathlessness with talking, and neurological symptoms like irritability or decreased cognitive awareness. We need to notify the healthcare professional immediately if the patient shows signs and symptoms of oxygenation or respiratory changes. We're going to uh, assess their uh, communication abilities and we're going to reposition these patients frequently every two hours. Po uh, another possible intervention is um, range of motion as well. And a test to, you can expect to be performed is a lumbar puncture. And most commonly, you're going to see an increase in protein levels in the cerebral spinal fluid. Plan, uh, plan of care, excuse me. We've already talked about diagnostics. We've talked about prior to nursing care. Treatment could also be um, plasmapheresis to remove those antibodies. Uh, we're going to treat with ventilation. We could use immunoglobulin, and we can use an NG tube if they show uh, signs of dysphagia. What is plasmapheresis? It's done like dialysis with a large machine um, that specially trained people from the blood center come and do. Um, and basically what they do is they separate the plasma from the whole blood, return the blood cells without the plasma, and then the plasma is usually replaced with something like albumin. Next is myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disorder where our antibodies bind to acetylcholine receptor sites and that inhibits normal muscle contraction. And it affects the eyes, face, lips, tongues, throat, and neck with a muscle weakness and a fatigue. So what are our signs and symptoms? Ptosis, that's called a drooping upper eyelid. Diplopia, double vision. Trouble closing their eyes, so therefore they could have dry eyes, so we may need to do frequent eye drops. They could have dysphagia or muscle weakness, especially later in the day. As the disease progresses, they can use, uh, excuse me, lose bowel and bladder control and or difficulty with respiratory function. So priority nursing inner assessments with an NG patient is a quality respiratory assessment. Another intervention is giving their medications on time. Typically, it's going to be 45 to 60 minutes before meals, so that way they can eat their meals with a decreased risk of aspiration. Uh, a word on Tessalon testing. Tessalon test is a method that helps diagnose First of all, does a patient have MG? Um, so Tensilon is given to the patient 
And if they have a quick improvement of their muscle weakness that lasts for four to five minutes, that we consider that a positive test for MG. So what they do is they inject them with the, uh, the Tessalon, and then they have the patients stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, cross, uncross their legs. And if their muscle strength gets better, they're positive for MG. Now, Tessalon can actually make their symptoms worse. And if that happens, we have to have the antidote on hand, which is atropine. MG can also have crises. You can have two types of crises. You can have a cholinergic or a myasthenic. Cholinergic means there's too much medicine on board. Okay? Myasthenic means there's too little meds on board. Tessalon can tell us which is which. So, if a patient has too much meds, it's cholinergic, you're going to see worsening in muscle weakness. If they have an MG crisis, there's not enough medicines, you're going to have symptoms of muscle weakness. If we give a patient that we don't know if they're having a cholinergic crisis or an MG crisis, if we give them Tessalon, and if they get better, it's an MG crisis. If we give it to them and they get worse, they have a cholinergic crisis and we're gonna have to give them atropine. This is um, very important to remember. So here it is on another slide, <laughs> just to help you break it down. Um, so myasthenia, too little medicine, cholinergic, too much medicine. Myasthenic, they're gonna get better with Tessalon. If it's cholinergic, they're gonna get worse. Therefore, we're gonna have to give them atropy. So how do we manage MG? So we are gonna trigger immunosuppressin because it's an uh, immune system, an autoimmune um, disorder. So uh, immune suppression is gonna induce remission, help control symptoms. Uh, so a glucocorticoid like prednisone and then we could use something like cyclophosphamide long-term, which is technically a chemotherapy drug. We could do something like plasmapheresis to get those um, uh, antibodies out of the blood supply. We could use uh, anticholinergic drugs um, like neostigmine. We are gonna provide respiratory supports we are gonna give them a high calorie diet. We're going to use BiPAP or CPAP if they need help with ventilation. We should advise and administer their medications 45 to 60 minutes before eating for maximum effect and always give their medicines on time. There's some health teaching we need to tell them what could make their condition worse. Things like having an infection, being under stress, having to have a surgery, if they overexercise, sedatives, enemas, all those things could trigger an exacerbation. So we want these people to avoid overheating crowds, overeating, erratic sleep habits, uh, emotional distress. These patients need to have good life skills and um, good social support in addition to their medications. Okay, so nearing the end, we're gonna switch over to peripheral nerve trauma. So it is what it sounds like. The nerves in the periphery become traumatized either through an injury or a wound. It could be um, uh, preoperative, uh, pre postoperative. Um, we could treat it with rest. We could treat it with um, wound care, we can treat it with taking them to the OR, that sort of thing. The big thing to know with nerves is they take a long time to heal. 
Um, generally, nerves take about six months to heal. And this slide shows you in bold the nerves that are most likely or most commonly affected by trauma. So um, basically, there's different stages of regeneration of a peripheral nerve after an injury. Um, we want basically just to protect them. So we know what our nerves do. They give us sensory information. So um, you could have a, a car accident where you have an injury to um, a nerve and then it's going to take six months for that to really regenerate. So during that six months, you've got to help them with their sensory. So they're not going to be able to distinguish between what is warm, what is hot. So tell them to use a thermometer to check their water temperature before they shower or bathe. They're not going to be able to tell if something is too tight. So make sure that they um, assess how things are fitting them their braces, their shoes, that sort of thing. Um, it's the same sort of thing that we would advise a patient that has diabetic neuropathy. Diabetic neuropathy is damage to those peripheral nerves. So, you know, they need to wear good fitting shoes. They shouldn't trim their own toenails. They should go to podiatrists. They should, you know, wear shoes all the time, reduce the risk of a foot injury, those sort of things. So really just use your common sense with what does a nerve do and how do we prevent them from injury injury and know that it takes time for these to heal. Okay, then we move on to restless leg syndrome. Basically, it's a paresthesia of the leg. You, they've got this unstoppable urge to move. Um, and uh, basically how we treat it is symptomatic ma management. Um, we can do some non-medical treatment like getting good sleep, um, exercising, um, not over-exercising, dealing with mental stress. Um, drug therapy may be effective for some people. Uh, Ropinol is a restless leg medication. Um, and these are usually something that we just take before bed. Uh, trigeminal neurologia is an incredibly painful condition. It's of the fifth cranial nerve, and this pain can be crippling, I mean incapacitating. It's described as a burning, shock-like, stabbing pain. It's terrible. Non-surgical management, we use drugs like anticonvulsants to block nerve firing, something like Tegretol. Um, we can use anti, or excuse me, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, they sometimes are effective. What we don't use are analgesics or opioids because they're just not effective at treating nerve pain. We can do surgical management, which basically, if you look at this slide, we go in and remove the pressure of that blood vessel that's over the trigeminal nerve. So, um, the bad thing is that it's a temporary fix, the surgery, and usually the pain's going to return in 12 to 15 years, if not sooner. So um, with trigeminal neuralgia, post-surgically, keep in mind that they may not have bilateral facial movement, um, and that's due to the post-surgical inflammation. And as they move out of that post-surgical stage, um, the findings will normalize. So immediately post-operative, just document the finding and don't panic. Um, then we go to Bell's palsy. This is the seventh cranial nerve. Um, it is an acute idiopathic paralysis or weakness of the facial nerve that affects one side of the face. It is more common in diabetics. We don't know why. Uh, the signs and symptoms, unilateral facial paralysis. So they can't close one eye. They can't wrinkle their forehead, smile, puff out their cheeks symmetrically. They could have some pain near the jaw and ear. They could have altered taste, dry, uh, dry eye, headache, um, hypercussis, so sounds seem louder. Um, and what are we going to do um, for this condition? Uh, well, first of all, we got a diagnosis properly. 
So um, we could do a CT or an MRI to rule out tumor or possible stroke. We could do an EMG, um, and that looks at the uh, electrical conduction in the muscle, and that gives us a prognosis. And then we can treat it. We can treat it with glucocorticoid steroids like prednisone. We can use analgesics for pain relief. We can use a cyclovir if we suspect that a virus has triggered this, triggered this condition. We can use um, warm, moist heat, facial exercise, massage, all these things will help. Okay, that brings us to the end of this PowerPoint. Thank you so much for listening. And if I can help clarify any of these conditions, please just send me an email. Thank you so much.